we're discussing the name of the machine, which is Babbage Difference Engine Number 202. Babbage is the inventor. That's his picture there. Uh, the third word is engine. An engine, to me, is something that relieves you from having to do the work. And a good example would be, remember Fred Flintstone and Marty, they go out to their car, they get in the car, they get their feet all the way down to the ground because there were no floorboards. They grabbed onto the edge of the vehicle and they ran with the vehicle. They were the engine. Okay, well, this is an engine in the sense that it does another kind of work, it does mental work, it does calculations. And it does them rather quickly, as you'll find out. Which brings us to the word in the middle. And this is not a rhetorical question, I'm actually asking you. What is the difference? That is difference engine. Find what they, what, what, why is it called that? What does that mean? Differential equations. No, it's not differential equations. That's a good guess. Per perform so, subtraction. Is a bad guess, so don't worry about, about that. Perform subtraction. The resultant. It's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it's all about. It's the difference, the result of a, of a subtraction. Subtraction of what? Well, two, two quantities, obviously. Uh, so, you know, so, something subtracted from something else. And in this particular instance, it's the difference between consecutive results of a polynomial equation calculation for different values of x. Keep put x put different values of x into an equation, consecutive values, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 10, 100, you know, that kind of thing, uh, and then take the difference between them, between those results, and you end up getting a table of numbers, a list of numbers, okay? Well, there's something rather interesting about that list of numbers, and I'm going to show you that with this, these equations that are over here, because this machine has to do with polynomial equations, which you learned in high school. But subtraction you learn back in grammar school. Okay. So let's take a look at the blackboard. The right hand <laughs> side top shows a what we call a third order polynomial equation. People down here aren't going to be able to see this uh, unless you stand up. Um, so this is an x cubed minus 2x squared plus 1 equation. And, and it could be any polynomial. The machine here is going to do a seventh order polynomial to the seventh um, But here's what happens. Put x equals 1 in here. You have 1 cubed, that's 1. 1 squared is 1. Times 2 makes it 2. We have 1 minus 2 plus 1. And the first result is 0. You got 0. Put 2 in there. 2 cubed is 8. 2 times 2 is 4. Times another 2 is another 8. So this cancels out then add 1, so the next result is 1. So for 1, we get 0. For 2, we get 1. For 3, we do not get 2. 3 cubed is 27. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. From 27 is 9 plus 1, we get 10. And then 33 is 76 and 145. Is, this result matches that equation. OK? All right. Now, do the differences between the seven <laughs> results. Subtract 0 from 1. If I take nothing away from 1, what do I have to learn answer? What is the difference? 1. So we write that on the column next door. Take 1 away from 10, you get 9. 10 from 33, you get 23. 33 from 76, you get 43. You get this column of numbers. That's what's called the first difference. Okay. Now here's something interesting. This turns out to be the results of another polynomial equation which is 3x squared minus x minus 1. Now, since this is the result of a polynomial equation, we can do the same thing, make the differences. So subtract 1 from 9, you get 8. 9 from 23, you get 14. 23 from 43, you get 20, and so on. And that turns out to be the results for another polynomial equation, which is 6x plus 2. Now, you can easily prove that 6 times 1 is 6 plus 2 is 8. 6 times 2 is 12, plus 2 is 14, 6 times 3 is 18, plus 2 is 20. This is the result for 6x plus 2. Now that's another set of numbers for another polynomial. So we can do it again. 
Take 8 from 14, you get 6. 14 from 20, you get 6. 20 from 26, you get 6. You get 6. It's always just 6. It doesn't matter what x is. But that's not 0. We're not down to 0 yet. So we can go and do it again. 6 from 6 is 0. 6 from 6 is 0. Everything to the right, diff 4 would be 0. Does everyone agree? Okay. Now here's what's really interesting about this. This is known as a table of differences, or a difference table. And I can now solve this polynomial equation by just doing addition. No multiplication. I'm going to ask you to give me a value inclusive between 1 and 4. Give me a number from 1 to 4. Okay, he's laughing, and I know why he's laughing. <laughs> I, I cannot so. stop laughing. <laughs> Okay, here's the, here's, the, here's the joke, and it's not funny. <laughs> Since the end of July, I have, been, I have never received an answer other than three. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Too late. Too late. You had your chance. You had four possibilities. You gave me three. Okay, so I'm going to pick the third line, the third row in this table. Now watch this. Add 23 to 10. What will 10 turn into if I add 23 to 10? The number below. Add 20 to 23, you get 43. Add 6 to 20, you get 26. Add 0 to 6, you get 6. So the third line produces the fourth line. The fourth line will produce the fifth line. The fifth line will produce the sixth line. And on and on and on it goes. All I'm doing is that. And that means I now can begin to compute this polynomial for much higher values of x by just continuing on down this process and never have to figure out what is what is x to the 99th power, the you know, third power of 99. I don't have to worry about that. Okay. Now, Babbage said, if I'm going to build a machine to do this, and it's a hundred, it's an x to the 99th polynomial, which means if I have 99 different hundred values on the table. How long is it going to take me to be able to do that with a machine? I'm going to have to have to do this to this, this to this, this. 99 consecutive ads to get another one line to get work to the next line. That's, I can't build a machine that can do that. It's too complicated. Is there another way? Well, he started looking at other ways, and one of the ones he found was quite interesting. You can come down to the diagonal. At 0 to 6, you get 6. At 6 to 14, you get 20. At 20 to 23, you get 43. At 43 to 33, you get 76. That diagonal produces the diagonal underneath it. Okay? So he marries the two concepts of going horizontally and going diagonally and comes up with a diagonal set of steps in pairs. He comes up with this. Odd and even columns. Add the odd column to the even column and do all odd even columns at the same time, simultaneously. So I add 6 to 8 and 9 to 1. I do them both at the same time. What happens to when I add 6 to 8? What do you get for an answer? Add 9 to 1. What do you get for an answer? So we get 14 and 10. So now we have 0 and 6, 14 to 9, and 10. Add 0 to 6 and add 14 to 9. Same time, you get 6 and 23. So now we've come from this step down to this step. And I can repeat the process. But now on a 100 column machine, it's add all odd even columns at once, then add all even columns at once, even odds at once, and I'm done. And it takes about eight seconds. So I can do all of these eight columns in about eight seconds. That's pretty fantastic. So he started, he, he designed a machine that could do that. But now the next question is probably the most important question of them all. Why? What's it all about? What's the point? What, for the, the bottom one? It's 3x squared minus x minus 1. Ah, you're thinking of the different, you're thinking of the first derivative. Yeah. It's not a derivative. Uh, okay, if you, if you want to, if you want to get into the mathematics of that, the derivative is the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. 
delta x is never zero here. Delta x is always one. So, how does that get derived? And the answer is you put the quantity x plus one into the original equation. You cube, you square, you factor them all out, then you subtract the original equation at x. So when you take the value at x plus 1 and subtract the value at x, what you get is the difference between the two, which is the next, which is that equation there. The really freaky thing is when you're testing this out for yourself and you think maybe it is the derivative, and you find that some of your difference columns are the derivatives and some of them aren't, I mean, you spend half an hour like I did trying to figure out why one of them is <laughs> the derivative. So let's get to the why. Why would this ever be designed? Well, actually, we need to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about his history. He was born in, he was born somewhere near London. One of the, one of the people that got here says it's not. Yeah. What's the name of the job? Plumbing. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't matter to me. He was born on December 26, in 1791. And that's an important date because that was my, my my dad wasn't born on that day, but he was born on the seventh twenty six. And he hated that birthday because he never got birthday presents. His Christmas presents always had to do. But his father was a rich banker and could afford to do anything with uh, for, for, for Charlie. Um, and in fact, when it came time to go to college, he sent him off to Cambridge, which was one of the most prestigious schools in the country. Wanted him to be a minister, but Charlie hated it. Came back. To First semester, so I want to be a mathematician. So he went back to, to the math school and got his degree in mathematics. And then he proceeded to no longer want to get any more degrees. He became really fascinated with something else: the formation of intellectual society. He got involved with that. He got to know a lot of uh, very famous people, like Charles Lyell, Charles Dickens, uh, Charles Darwin, a lot of guys named Charles. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> So anyway, what happened next was uh, he got approached by someone named John Herschel, who was a, a budding astronomer who was in the astronomy club. And uh, John says, you know, we, we ran out of, math of our astronomy tables. And so we went to a publisher to publish new ones, and he ran out of material. So we went to a second publisher to publish the rest of the, of the number that we wanted. And now we've got these two volumes from separate publishers, and we don't know if they match. Are they the same? So would you be willing to compare them with me one night? So he came over and they went through them one night. They had to find discrepancies. They got to one page with so many discrepancies it really annoyed Charlie to the point where he speaks to his feet. It's like, my God, I wish these values had been executed by steam. <laughs> Get rid of the human element. What was the human element? Well, he had a, a library, 300 volumes of mathematical tables. So he went and started looking at them and discovered they were all being done by something called the method of differences. Polynomial equations, the different curves, logarithms, sines, cosines, you name all those various things, okay? And all that work was being done over in France by unemployed French hairdressers. <laughs> it, was, it was a men's guild. Basically, I guess the French Revolution put them out of business. So, they were retrained, and their job title was a computer. And they were computing these tables by hand, adding, 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 adding have multiple people doing one particular equation and they would compare their results and make sure they got the same thing. So he realized it wasn't the, the calculations that were going wrong, it's what happened to those calculations when they were done. These pages that were formulated were given to a typesetter to actually produce the page that you wanted to print. And he was making all kinds of errors setting up the type. Very easy when you consider He's populating it right to left because he's going to play it upside down. He's right to the facing and putting it in backwards and he's reading the paper the other way. Okay? And you can easily see how you can lose track of where he is. Skip a, skip a digit, add a digit, you name it. So it was the, the actual typeset. So he said, okay, I can build a machine that will do the mechanical typeset, but how are we going to load it? We can't have people load it. So we're going to have to have somebody, you know, I'm going to have to build a machine that actually calculates the values to put into the printer. But that's very expensive. I can't afford to do that. So he goes back and looks at the library and notices a lot of those volumes in there are government tables, navigation tables, actuarial tables, construction tables. They're all things that the government is using. So he goes to the British government and says, did you know that your tables are full of errors? Yeah, we know. What can we do about it? Well, I can build you a machine, which you need 
you act to a table, no human involvement, just crank them up. That sounded pretty good to them, so they decided to fund his project. In 1823, he starts designing the difference engine. Now, he can't do the work of actually making the parts. So he hires the best blacksmith in London to do this. His name was Joseph Clement. And Clement takes these designs and starts actually formulating the big part. And nine years go by with this going on. And pretty soon the people are clamoring, where's this difference engine you were going to build? So he goes to Clement and says, look, I'm being inundated with requests to be able to show this off. Uh, can you make, take time off and build a little pre-call version of this thing so that I can show you? So Clement takes off six months, builds this new three-column version, gives it to Babbage. Babbage demonstrates it at a soiree. The people ask, is this the whole machine? Oh, no, this is just a little bit of it. So they begin to call it a beautiful fragment, a little piece of the big machine. Next year, the 10th year of this project, uh, the government has heard about it. So they come to Babbage and say, OK, is this our machine here? He said, no, no, we're, we're only half done. Uh, what's the hole? We don't understand what happens if we don't know the hole. Well, it's going to be 24,000 parts, and we've got 12,000 parts made. So the government says, are you kidding? We've spent 10 years, 17,000 pounds on this project, and you're telling us we only have done. We can't afford to win another kid. By the way, 17,000 pounds in those days, the typical British talent was 50 pounds a year. This was 34 people's salary over the entire 10 years. A lot of money. At this point, Babbage doesn't know quite what to do except to get Clement, Clement to move his shop over to his side of the Thames River so they can work much more quickly in time together. So he goes to him and proposes or tells him, I want you to move your shop over to my side of the Thames. But then he adds, oh, by the way, I can't afford to pay you to make the move. Well, this was the last straw for Clement. Now, British law says that whoever makes the parts owns the parts. Clement made the parts. So they were all his. And then the government steps in and says, no, no, if you're going to quit, if you're going to divorce yourself from, from Babbage, you're going to have to give him some of the parts because he was the designer of the design. So Clement gives him a smattering of parts that with no consequence. He keeps all the important parts, keeps it all of his tools. Meanwhile, what does Babbage have? He's in the beautiful fragment. He's got part of his design. Clement's actually still got part of his design as well. And he's only got a smattering of parts. And then Clement looks at these parts that he's got and realizes they're not doing him any good in that form. So he melts them down and uses them for something else. So at this point, it really puts the axe to the project and the government pulls the button. So his, his, his difference engine is, is not going to be real. He turns his attention to a new project. He starts designing an analytical engine. There's design panels over there that show He works on that for several years, and around the mid 1840s, about 1847, he realizes he could have economized on his original difference engine. Instead of 24,000 parts, he could get it down to 8,000. So he spends the next two years redesigning it and calls it difference engine number two. Goes to the British government with the design that they won't build. They've already been burned by him once, and they're not going to get burned by him again. So he puts the plans away, and keeps on working on the analytical engine, and in October of 1871, he does. And nothing has been built. The analytical engine has been built, none of the different engines, and so on. Waste of time. His sons inherit this stuff, they get the beautiful fragment, they get the smattering of parts, they get all the plans. Uh, for different engine number two, and they don't know quite what to do with them. Eventually, by 1875, they decide to give them to the London Science Museum. The Science Museum exhibits the beautiful fragment and the, plan, and the plans, and they go into the vaults in the basement, disappear from history for 110 years. Now, we're not going to wait 110 years. Uh, what I'm going to have you do is, is do you get them all back? Um, I think this would be a little bit tight. We should, we could, we on the front. So we're gonna we're now we're gonna show you how this thing works, front and back. So we're gonna start. If you want, half of you can go to the back. Switch. Yeah. Yeah. Half of you can go to the back. Half of you can stay here. We're gonna crank the machine. I'm gonna be talking about the front, and I'm gonna go talk about the back. So we get it all done in one shot. So the front 
you're going to see is the adding hat. By the way, we're going to rotate around. We're going to do it again, so you all we all get to see it. That hat, people. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Half of you need to go to the back, or we're never going to get this done. Don't worry. I'll explain both sides. Then you'll just be able to watch. So we're going to crank it. And I'm going to explain the front. Then we're going to stop. I'm going to go to the back, and I'm going to explain the back. We'll crank it again. Okay. Here we go. This column adds to this column. The odd column count adds to the even column, and it does it by counting down to zero and transmitting the value through the gear in between to the column next door. Both of them go in a counterclockwise turning direction. The number one. This goes clockwise. This one counts down. This one counts up because the numbers on the number ones are in reverse order. One of them's got the numbers going around that way, and one's got the numbers going around this way. So we're going to count this down to zero and add to this column. When it's all done, we've destroyed the value on the odd column. It's zero. We have to restore it because we have to add the even column to the odd column. Remember? On the blackboard? So I have to put it back to its original value. But the gear in between remembers what it is. So we lift this gear up 3 sixteenths of an inch, which disengages it from the even side because it's thin, but the other side is thick and remains engaged with the odd column. And we put the odd column back to where it belongs. So it's add, lift up, separate from the even column, and reset the odd. Now we're having finished that, we're all done with the add process, including the reset. So we lift the gear up once more, so we disengage completely from both the even and the odd, and then the, gear, the, the gears between the two columns of even and odd drops to the bottom. Then we do the odd column counts down. The, the even column counts down and adds to the odd column. Lift it up, reset the even column, lift it up again, and repeat the process. So here's what it looks like. Everybody's back here. You see how it works back there? You're just going to, ooh, and everybody's going to want back there. So here's the add. Here's the reset. Here's the next add. Here's the reset. And then we're back to the odd column, adding to the even. Resetting the odd, adding the even to the odd, resetting the even, and back and forth and back, all the way across. Switch, switch places. Okay, so back to the front, front to the back, back when I explain the back. 